Yes. Welcome. Uh, this is going to be the last breakout session of the day. I hope you guys had a great time. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Donald Farmer uh, to my right, who is the VP of Product Management at Click, which is the leading vendor in the emerging field of business discovery, a user-driven approach to business intelligence. Uh, before working at Click, he was a leader of the Microsoft BI team. He is the author of several books and is a guest professor at Southwest University of Chongqing. Nicely pronounced. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you very much for coming along after, after lunch and the last session of the day. Um, so let's start with the, the, the very first part of my presentation. How was your breakfast this morning? <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Good? Well, kind of mixed opinions about it. This is actually a very important question. Um, for business intelligence. We'll come back to it a little later. But what I really want to talk about are two things. Um, and the first is the most important technological change that we have seen in information technology in certainly in the last kind of 20, 30 years, certainly since the invention of the PC. And for many people in that audience, that means the biggest technological change you've seen in your lifetime. Sadly, not in my lifetime, but, uh, but it's really very important. And it's this, it's, it's very simple. But it's very significant, and most of us overlook it. We now have better technology at home than we do in the office. When you come into your office in the morning and you swipe your card and you log in, you're downgrading your technology experience. <laughs> at home, you have better cameras, you have better computers, you have cheaper, better, faster storage. Every time you come into the office, it's a downgrade. That has never happened before. But it's a dramatic and significant change because it means that consumer technology is actually leading business decisions. People come into the office expecting a level of technological support that they have in their personal lives, and they don't get it from their IT departments. They don't get it from their analytic programs. They don't get it from their, their hardware suppliers. That's really quite a shock, and it's going to continue that way forever. That, that's now changed. So one of the things, I'll give you an example. My company, um, well actually we're a public company, so I better not tell you just exactly how much we spent on our video conferencing system, but we spent a lot of zeros on a video conferencing system that joins up our offices in Sweden and Boston and Philadelphia and London and Singapore and Canada. And um, my team, we use Google Hangouts all the time. And not only that, the cameras are better than the many hundreds of thousand dollar cameras that we bought from, from, from the networking system. And the, the very fact that we spent so much on that big system means we cannot change it. You know, the IT guys are waiting for it all to be amortized and, and all that money to kind of be, 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 be spent. And meanwhile, I can go down to, you know, I'll go on to Amazon probably or go down to a store and buy a brand new camera. It cost me 60 bucks, I can expense it, and I've got better quality on Google Hangouts. That's a tremendous change. We see it in bring your own device, trend of bring your own device. But we're also seeing it in bring your own software, bring your own data, bring your own everything. Just bring your own to the party. And the IT department's role has completely changed now. They can barely keep up with what the business users were doing. And when I started in information technology, when I started in data analysis, the IT departments were the only people who had the knowledge, the knowledge of the data, the knowledge of the system, the knowledge of the protocols, the knowledge of the storage, the knowledge of the, the, the modeling systems to make it all work. And nowadays, you can go out and build this stuff pretty much yourself very, very easily. So that's the first thing. Now, the other thing that happens is because this power is now in the hands of the business user, they are making decisions with data. They're making decisions with technology. And we're hoping they make better informed decisions. But there's a problem with that. You don't make better informed decisions. You don't make rational decisions. You're all, well, let me call it non-rational rather than, I don't want to say irrational. People might throw things at me, but you're all non-rational. We think we're like Dr. Spock. We think we make carefully calculated you know, uh, decisions with, our, with our, our dashboards and our calculations. It's just not true. It actually all comes back to that question of breakfast. Did you enjoy your breakfast this morning? Well. We did an experiment. We used, um, we used Amazon for it. We used um, the Mechanical Turk in, in Amazon where you can get thousands of people to take part in kind of experiments online. And we asked people a very simple question. Did you enjoy your breakfast? 
and they saw this picture of the guy looking rather sick off Cape Cod. And um, we took a holdout group and we asked them the same question. Did you enjoy your breakfast? And guess what? A statistically significant, and I'm not going to say that again, an important number of people actually um, said, yes, I did enjoy my breakfast more when I looked at this picture. And no, I didn't enjoy my breakfast when I looked at that picture. How is this possible? Your breakfast was eight hours ago. You either enjoyed it or you didn't. But the answer is actually influenced by the picture you see at the point at which you make the decision and press that button, yes or no. I didn't ask my question. And by the way, this isn't just funny. This is deadly serious. In Israel, they did a rather horrifying study when they looked at judges. Judges sitting in a parole court where people were coming up asking for parole from their sentences. And they could look at judges across the entire country. And they discovered that if you saw a judge and asked him for parole or asked her for parole after the afternoon coffee break, you were five times more likely to get parole than if you asked them immediately before the afternoon coffee break. That's scary. Now, these are people who are trained and highly paid and qualified and chosen and selected for their ability to make rational judgments and apply them consistently. Five times more likely after they've had a cup of coffee. Or maybe it's the cookie. I don't know. It's the blood sugar. You know? But that's, that is scary. In Germany, they did an experiment where they asked judges to come into a room and score some model crimes, just sitting down with some paper and give some scores. And as they waited for this experiment to start, there were pictures in the room of fluffy lambs and kittens and spring flowers and blue skies. And another set of judges had black and white pictures of churches and tombstones and morbid things. And the judges who saw the fluffy lambs and happy kittens, they gave a certain set of sentences. And how well, you can guess already, the guys who saw the grim pictures, they gave longer sentences than the people who saw the happy ones. But when I say longer, I mean on average eight times longer. Wow. This is just, I mean, the, the results aren't marginal here. The emotional impact of your environment on your decision making is truly profound and significant. And we're giving all this power to business users. They're making all these decisions with technology. And we're saying, yeah, yeah, go serve yourself. What on earth are we going to do when they're, you know, the truth is they're probably much more influenced by the pictures on the office wall than they are by any of the data quality procedures or things that you have put in place around them. That's actually a fairly scary thought. The other problem with this is it's, it's not even as if we take time to do this rational thinking. So I'm going to, can you complete this sentence? 17 times 23 equals? OK, well, this is obviously not the technical <laughs> audience today. That's uh, 391. 17 times 23 is 300. You can't do that one, can you? 17 times 23, 391. They're both prime numbers. It actually makes it more difficult. But 17 times 23, 391. It's, you just can't do it straight off the top of your head. I can't do it. I actually have it written down you know, on this, in the notes <laughs> of the slide. OK, what about this one? Fish and? No. <laughs> This is the Northwest. I was thinking of fish and wildlife. Um, or actually, maybe I was thinking of Fish and Richardson, the intellectual property lawyers, whose logo I'm using without permission, which is rather scary. But um, <laughs> this is important. There you go. Fish and every, Americans don't even call fries chips. Why on earth did you say fish and chips? <laughs> I come from a country where we know what chips are. And, you can, and yet, you automatically, fish and chips. You did that instantly. You can't do 17 times 23, but you can, you can leap linguistically across an ocean and say fish and chips. <laughs> this is scary. This is, you know, this, look at your decision-making process in action here. So we are not rational. We are not rational decision-makers. And the influence of irrationality is not small or marginal. That's really important. It's very, very significant. Now, there's another important point about technology I want to come back to, which is this, this, the nature of the technology that we have today that we're using. Um, I talked about bring your own device. And that's actually very, very important. The mobile experience is a significant part of bringing these technologies to us. And I'm going to join these two themes, the analytic theme and the mobile theme later on. But let's talk about this one for a moment. Because mobile technologies are not just about mobility. 
In fact, the mobile aspect of a mobile technology may be the least interesting thing about it. It's not the fact that you can take it anywhere. To a certain extent, we've always been able to take technologies anywhere. I used to have an old Osborne. It was like, it literally weighed 34 pounds. I used to have to carry it around with this big, I mean, it just broke my back carrying that thing around when I was doing a consultancy. But that old Osborne, it was portable. I was sitting around um, a table with some analysts just a couple of weeks ago at a conference, and um, they, they had iPads and iMacs and things like that. So uh, MacBook Air, for, for example, which is a very, very portable machine. It was very interesting to me that they called the iPad a mobile device, but they didn't call the MacBook Air a mobile device. That's a laptop. But an iPad with a, you've got an iPad with a keyboard sitting at the front there, but that's apparently a mobile device. The, the one pound, kind of two pound iPad Air apparently is not mobile. This is crazy if you ever brought up, brought up with the kind of technology that I grew up with. So what is the importance of the mobile device if it's not its mobility? It's actually this, it's touch. You can touch the mobile device, it's the touch interface. And the touch interface has a tremendous impact. Anybody can use a touch interface. Anybody at all. It's really quite dram dramatic. Um, there's actually a program called Apps for Apes. Um, you go there, redapes.org. And Apps for Apes actually delivers iPad applications so that, that apes, orangutans, and gorillas can FaceTime with each other and not get bored in the zoo. They couldn't do that if they had to enter kind of codes and things or use a keyboard. They can do it because it's a touch interface. You see the picture of the baby playing with a touch interface. My cat has a Friskies application on my iPad that she loves playing with. Friskies actually had a, a developer hackathon in Los Angeles recently to develop new games for cats. This is all possible because of the touch interface. The touch interface is so natural for two reasons. First of all, it actually enables you to explore. And touch is our natural way of interacting with the world outside us. And it encourages you to explore in a very interesting way. We have a customer in the Netherlands. Um, they're a, a mortgage broker, mortgage vendor, that you can go in like, um, like a retail mortgage vendor. So if you want to buy a house, you go in and you sit down. You'll go through all the mortgages and choose the one that you want, car loans and things like that. And they use our product, like Click, and um, they have ClickView on a laptop. And they would sit down with you and go through the ClickView application on the laptop, and you would choose the right um, mortgage for yourself. And um, people would either kind of go away and say, I think about it, or I don't want it. Or some of them would be, as they called it, converted. They would, they would take a mortgage. So they're really interested in the conversion rate. How many people come into the store and actually take a mortgage there and then in the store? And as it happened, they decided to move from the laptop application to an iPad application. And when they did that, it was really good because they didn't do it all at once. They rolled it out gradually. So we could actually compare stores. There were even stores in the same city, some with iPads and some with laptops. The conversion rate, people coming into the store and taking a mortgage, was 30% higher in the iPad stores. 30% higher. Just just because they had an iPad. And also what was interesting is we could track using the logs how long people are spending on the machines. That is exactly the number. They spent exactly 30% longer exploring the data with the iPad than they did with the laptop. So not only did they spend longer exploring, but they had more confidence. They made a decision better with the, 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 with the touch interface. And that's really critical. Touch is such an important part of our experience. But there's something else about touch that's actually kind of critical. Uh, there's a gentleman at the front here with, a, with an iPad, and you've got a keyboard. Has anybody else got an iPad without a keyboard? OK, so are you using it just now? Anybody? Yeah, you're using an iPad with a keyboard? Without, without a keyboard. Oh, you've got a little stand there, yeah? It's very interesting. OK, so, so let's take it off the stand and just kind of maybe flick through it or browse through it or something. You'll see something very interesting happening. Can you do that? Sorry, that's a hassle. I don't know. OK. And then you, you're working on yours. Yeah? So something very important about these two examples. Let me show you. It's exactly this difference. When you browse with an iPad or any other device without the keyboard, it's what we call a lean back user experience. You literally, your body is in a different position. You lean back, you lean forward. It's very, very significant difference. Now, why is that significant? 
well, frankly, the pictures on the wall influence your decision by 800%. I think this is actually pretty damn significant. Yeah? The physical position you're in actually changes the experience of it. The lean back experience is a browsing experience. It's a relaxed, let me see what comes to me, let me sort through this, let me explore experience. You sit on the couch, you use your iPad. You sit at a desk, you put a keyboard on it, or you use the laptop. It's a very different type of experience. Which brings us to this guy. I did promise, I think I've done breakfast and gorillas already. So now we're on to, and fish, yeah. So now we're on to squirrels. What has he got to do with all this? Well, this little guy lives about 10 miles northeast of here in a town called Woodenville. And um, he lives on my property. And he's a very advanced business intelligence user. And not just because he lives on my property. Um, he actually has some really interesting problems to solve. And the way he solves his problems is core to how you will enable people to navigate the world of data without relying only on kind of short-term emotional decisions, without relying on highly technical decisions. Because the way he does it is he forages. He's in, um, he's in a hazelnut tree here, and he loves, um, he loves hazelnuts. And um, I don't know how he finds the hazelnut tree. We've only got like four hazelnut trees. We have maybe, we have got a couple of acres. So we've got lots of pine trees, we've got lots of alder trees, um, lots of things with uh, stuff that I suppose squirrels like to eat, but he really loves the hazelnuts. And he finds the hazelnuts at a particular time of year, and um, he knows where the trees are. And every generation of squirrels discovers these trees. How does a squirrel find a hazelnut tree? Well, they need to know certain signs. Um, they need to know, for example, the kind of leaves that are on it. So they're not going to go to a pine tree and mistake it for a hazelnut tree because it looks completely different. They're going to look at a hazelnut tree and they're going to find, when they get on there, has it got nuts on it or not? Because maybe all the nuts have been eaten and uh, maybe all the nuts have disappeared. And the squirrel actually has to make some very important decisions when it's foraging. And you see this when birds are foraging as well. When birds are in trees eating berries, they don't eat every single berry on the tree. They eat as many berries as they can, and then at some point, it takes them too much energy to hop around the tree looking for the few remaining berries, so they actually fly to another tree which has got more. And they do that because they get a clue from the other tree. It's the color, it's the scent. And this word scent is actually really important. Sometimes it's literally scent. If an animal is foraging by smell, sometimes it's just clues, like color and so on, that, that gives them the clue. But they know where to go because they can pick up the clues. They don't do a careful biological examination of every leaf in the tree and say, yes, taxonomically, this is a hazelnut tree. I'll climb up it and find out what's there. They know what a hazelnut tree looks like, and they can get this through the clues. And this is really important because that is the way we handle data as well. We are information foragers, as Peter Paroli has put it. When you Google, these are three search engines, Google, Baidu, S-Search from Thailand. They all have certain things in common. Um, but the critical thing they have in common is that they enable foraging. So what do they have in common? Um, first of all, they have the simplest user experience you can imagine. There's, like, there's a text box and a button. If you, if you Google, you get two buttons because you're the market leader. But that's about it. You know, so there's a text box and a button. And the things they have in common, the characteristics they have, is this simple user experience. They also return vast amounts of data more data than you could possibly handle. And they're very, very fast. And these three things put together solve the analytic problems that are vast and complex that you have to deal with. So if I'm looking for a, I, my company is based in Sweden, so quite often I have to go to Stockholm and Copenhagen, and things like that. So I'm, I, I'm looking for hotels in Sweden. I say, hotels in Sweden. I get like 500 million hits or something. It's just ridiculous. It's, it's, Google, you know, they return everything that's ever mentioned hotel in Sweden. So I get a huge number of hits. And I notice that there's things like backpacker hostels and things like that. So I don't want to stay in a backpacker hostel. So I, I immediately revise my search. And I say, business hotels in Sweden. And they kind of come back and I don't get 500 million. I get 100 million hits or something. And at this point, I think, OK, well, I need to narrow it down a bit more. And I know what my company's like. So it's like cheap business hotels in Sweden. <laughs> I get zero hits, and then I'm back to the, the hostel. But the critical thing there is I'm revising so quickly. There's a huge amount of information, and I can revise it like that. I do not need to learn a query language. 
I'm not constructing the perfect query to return just the information I want. I'm putting in pretty general things, getting information back, using those one or two lines that appear in the search engine to give me information sent. And just like the squirrel looking for hazelnuts, I quickly know what I'm looking for. And if I get there and it's not quite what I'm looking for, because it's a content form or something, I just click the back button and immediately I do my search again. And it's that speed and interactivity and the volume of data that comes back that gives me the confidence that I'm finding the right stuff, the ability to navigate to it, and the information sent that gives me context for it. And Google therefore solves the most complex analytic problems. Now, when I first started using the internet, I started using an academic net called JNet back in the, um, back in the UK many years ago. And, um, you know, we had DARPA over here, and then the internet started. And you had these search engines, things, Alta Vista. Remember Alta Vista, Lycos? I remember Lycos with the dog. That was awesome. I loved Lycos. Um, but you had to learn a query language. It was plus and minus and, you know, the AND operator, the OR operator, the inverted commas, the brackets. You had to do all these things in order to construct a query because the system wasn't fast enough, it wasn't indexed enough, and the method of giving you sent wasn't good enough. So you actually had to narrow down the answer space. And Google cut right through that and said, we'll give you everything but will give you the speed and the tools that enable you to navigate it. And that actually is the secret. It's a bit like going to um, a library. Remember, remember this library? <laughs> seen this? Yeah? It's a bit like going to a library. You know, when you go to, to an old library, um, especially when I went to that university, you'd go to the library, and if you wanted to get something from the catalog, you had to ask the librarian, you know, specifically what you want. I had to go to the card catalog. I couldn't go in and say, you know, do you have any books on the Scottish Enlightenment? They say, well, yeah, there's like a whole floor of books in the Scottish Enlightenment. And I, I had to ask them for this specific book. I might, if I was lucky, be able to ask for two or three titles, and they would grudgingly bring them to me. But in a modern library, it's actually much better. I mean, you know, you can go into a library and say, hey, you know, I got this one book. But go into a library that you can browse, and the experience is very different. First of all, you don't need to know exactly what you're looking for. You need to know where to find it, but you're not querying, you're browsing. And browsing gives you more information. I can flick through these books. Let's say I was looking for a history of Seattle. I might find a book I was looking for. I might find books I wasn't looking for. I'll find related books, associated books. And I, I use information sent to find them. It's the cover, it's the author's name, it's the title, it's flipping through, looking at the index, looking at the context, reading the blurb in the back, looking at the pictures. That's all sent. I don't sit down and read every single book. I just scan the information, get the scent of what I want, and if necessary, I'll go to another shelf and look somewhere else if that's not exactly what I'm looking for. This is a big difference. We can do this because we are also foragers. We're hunters just like the squirrel. And we have exactly, people have actually modeled this. Peter Paroli at the US Navy Research Department modeled the way people use the internet. And the models are information foraging models. They look exactly like the models that animals use when they forage for food. The other thing that we have in our world, which is also very important to this, is we have hierarchies. Yeah? Now hierarchies, if you go, if all of us work in businesses with hierarchies. Unless you're in a one or two person business, you work with a hierarchy. And you know, anybody understands a hierarchy. Every wolf understands what a hierarchy is. Hierarchies feel very natural. But actually they're not. At least not the way in which we organize them within businesses, within enterprise, within analytic organizations. Because we structure the way in which people work according to an operational model. But that's not a natural model. It's actually very artificial. It's so artificial that you know, cubicle land just feels horrible if you live in cubicle land. There's this horrible case from California. <laughs> Somebody, you know, death of county worker found in cubicle land. Down there, been there for a day before I even noticed that they, they'd gone. This is not a natural system, okay? This is not a natural way of working. What's natural is to have cooperation. You know, how, it's funny, I was looking at, a, and I won't say who it was, but I was looking at a vendor the other day, and they had um, a, a flyer, and they're not here, but they had a flyer, and they talked about how they enabled collaboration between information workers. You don't enable collaboration between information workers. Information workers cannot help collaborating. Two people standing at the water cooler talking about this month's or this semester's or this year's numbers 
They're collaborating on data. You can't stop people collaborating on data. What you can do is provide tools which make that collaboration easier, which make that collaboration um, more rich in content. But you don't need to help people collaborate. We are compulsive collaborators. We do that anyway. The real structure of our society is much more like this. We tell stories. We communicate. We collaborate. We're fundamentally social beings as well as emotional beings, as well as non-rational beings, and as well as being information foragers. As a friend of mine said very wisely, people just don't trust data. They only trust other people. When you get numbers from your data team, when you get a data feed, if you look at a set of um, you know, latest reports, do you trust that number? Actually, you don't. What you really trust is the person who gave you the number. You don't edit, you don't audit, you don't go and look at the metadata of every number that lands on your desk. You could never do that. It's actually trust. If they get it wrong, you might not trust them again. Then you might go and audit. But mostly you work on the basis of trust. And trust is a very human thing. And this is something that I'm trying to get across, I think, that we are fundamentally human beings in this, in this process. So what's this got to do with, in a sense, with analytics? What can we do to solve these problems? Clearly, there's some hints here in what I've said. Give people touch interfaces. They will explore, they will discover. Exploring and discovering and browsing and foraging is more likely to give people complete results. They're going to find the results that are related. They're going to find the results that are not related. They're going to get a better sense of the context than if you give them one number. If you give them one number, if you give them one dashboard, if you give them one visualization, what you're saying is, first of all, trust me. And secondly, you're saying, I want you to take a shortcut decision based on only the information I'm showing you. And they're going to shortcut, and they're going to come up with the equivalent of fish and chips. But that answer is also going to be influenced by all the other things that are going on in the world at the time. Give them time to explore. And they'll take that extra time to explore, and they'll find all the other alternatives. And just like the person browsing in the library, they'll find the richer experience. We call this, um, we actually call it natural analytics. And the reason we call it natural analytics is we're trying to bring technologies that work with the way in which you work. I love this example. You all know the QWERTY or the ASRT typewriter, depending where you live. The QWERTY typewriter was designed and delivered. This is the original. Um, patent design for it. It was designed for a very simple purpose, which was to stop the um, keys from sticking. I think this is a well-known story. Because the, the keys which were closest together and mo used most frequently would jam together, they took the most frequently used letters, combinations, and they put them far apart so that there would be less likelihood of them jamming. Amazingly, even in the world of touch technology, and I bring out my tiny little computer and it still has a QWERTY keyboard. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing on here that's going to jam mechanically together. I hope not anyway. And um, I don't need it, but that's just become so persistent. It's an unnatural system which helped us at one time, but now actually gets in the way. How many people here can type properly? No, you're kidding. Really? Actual? Wow. Which conference is this? Oh, am I in the right place? That's right. I mean, I, I'm strictly two fingers. I was really, wow, okay. I'm super impressed. Okay, I'll slip in the next guy's slide. Um, this is a much more naturally, oh, actually, what am I saying? I'm Scottish. I, I try to get Siri to understand me, it's almost impossible. <laughs> Which is, actually is, honestly, is the reason I have a Samsung rather than, a, rather than a, an Apple. It, it understands the Scottish accent better. Um, but speech input is more natural. The only thing you have to learn with a speech input is how to make yourself understood which again is a fundamental human skill. Doing this is not a fundamental human skill. But speaking and making yourself understood is a fundamental human skill. We do it all the time with children, with um, audiences, with um, foreigners. We make ourselves understood. Let's look at this. What do you make of these numbers? Anything interesting there? Difficult to tell, isn't it? Let me show you this. Same numbers. Two things about this. First of all, it's kind of difficult. Maybe if you're an accountant, you would kind of get it. But, but these numbers, immediately you can see the, the collapse in August. What on earth happened in August? I can tell you what happened in August. Sweden was on holiday. Um, but I can, I can look at these numbers and say, uh, 
you know, I immediately see the outlier. Not only do I immediately see it, even more important, I cannot not see it. I cannot help but see it. No matter what I do to these numbers, I will see that outlier. That will draw, att draw attention to itself. The other thing is you can see the trend. Now, that trend is kind of hidden a little bit because the numbers are going up and down, but you can see the trend. And again, you cannot not see it. You will project that forward into, in, into the future. This is unnatural. This is, gives you immediate insight. This has information sent. It's not just the visualization that's helping you. It's the fact that this has additional information that you can see. It has trends, it has outliers, and you cannot help but see them. The other thing is about this is our natural capacity. We evolved, we developed our minds in order to survive in an immensely complex information environment. Being able to see the snake and the undergrowth is actually a very complex cognitive task. But we wouldn't have survived if we couldn't do it. We actually have these natural built-in abilities. So what I'm suggesting is really three things. First of all, do not believe that because you're giving people, what do we used to call it, the right data and the right time and the right format, that they will make the right decision. They won't. They will make irrational decisions which are based on many things that you don't have control of. So the second point is give them more information than they need. Enable them to browse, enable them to forage so they can find the surrounding patterns. And do that with ex interfaces and experiences that encourage that foraging. Touch interfaces, visual interfaces that draw people in and encourage them to explore. With these three things, you can actually get over that analytic gap between people having to make a decision and people having confidence because they understand the full structure of it. So um, let me wrap up and we, I, I wanted to leave some time for questions. So uh, what's 17 times 22? No, that was 17 times 23. That's 374. See how easy it is to train somebody <laughs> to immediately jump to the wrong answer. If I'd given you the opportunity to explore and calculate, you'd have got it right. So there we go. That's my thesis of why breakfast gorillas, squirrels, and fish are actually kind of important to the world of analytics. Shall we have questions? Yeah, please. So, um, I love the idea of data exploration, and I know that a lot of times the customers of these analyses are, um, you know, C-level executives or something. Right. Who uh, really don't, maybe aren't predisposed to asking or inclined to do that exploration. They really, they just want the numbers. They want the red, yellow, green. Um, you know, so how do you? Do you have a, do you have a suggestion? Is there like, a, are we trying to change the CEOs or like what's the deal? Well, so you'll never change a CEO. That's important. So I, I come back to this. You know, when I when I worked at Microsoft, we built dashboards for the uh, the senior executives to, to and they're one of the world's largest companies. You know, they're very data driven. They're all data people. And it's Microsoft, so they all wanted you know, all the executives wanted all the latest stuff. They wanted all the animated bubble charts and graphs and spinny things and fancy reports, and they wanted it on every device. And it was great, except in the corner of every dashboard, there was a little button that said B on it. That was the Steve Ballmer button, and when you pressed it, all the graphics went away, and you just got like numbers, because he was a numbers guy, and he just he just wanted numbers. Um, and you know, just, sometimes you find people like um, accountants, and they they, can, they still do that scan. You know, they scan a page of numbers like that. You, my my father-in-law is an accountant, and he just automatically just scans columns and numbers. Um, the thing about the executives is they're just human beings. This may, this may this is a stretch of the imagination, but they are just human beings like everybody else. <laughs> And, and therefore, they're actually susceptible to the same rules and to the same cognitive processes. And very importantly, they cannot not see that either. That's why I, this is actually why I mentioned that, that um, if you give people the right experience, give them the right interface, and give them the right um, tools, they will find themselves drawn into it. Sure, first thing in the morning, they may sit down and open the dashboard and, and just have to make a decision because they're pressed for time. They will, there will be many occasions when they do that. But don't think for a moment that they don't have time during the day at which they will sort of noodle on those numbers, especially if they find that outlier. 
if they see those things. Now, they don't need to be concerned with everything that's going on. You don't want them spending all their time exploring the data. But when they have to do it, so long as they have the tools, so long as they have the experiences, then they'll be drawn into it and do that. And that's the interesting thing. You can't help it. That's the kind of cool thing about it. Any other questions? Yes, please. Well, I mean, I guess uh, my, I do development, and I also do reporting. So there are like a million ways I could make the reports look really good. Uh, you know, and kind of, when, sure. especially when you start looking at, you know, more of like graphics and visuals and things, you know, even just timing, like when I start campaigns, and yeah. they can look better year after year. Um, uh, I guess what method do you have in, or suggest for kind of creating those um, checks and balances to kind of at least come to something that's recognizably... So it's important. It's not so much about making them look good, although it helps when things are aesthetically pleasing. The key thing is to get away from thinking about user interface and start thinking about user experience. Now, I know when I talk to people who design dashboards for executives, and executives are actually a great example of that, um, people talk about the user interface. They say, well, what am I going to put on the screen? And when you come to my team, and my, my team's got some interesting people in it. We hired, um, we've got a guy, we're based in Sweden. We have a guy who worked for IKEA designing furniture, and he now works in our design team. We have a guy who designed websites for the blind in London. And that's a, that's a user interface challenge, if ever there was one. And he, he works in our team. We have people who've got really interesting design backgrounds. They would not ask the executive, how do you want to lay out this stuff on the screen? What visualization do you want? How do I show you these numbers better? They actually start the questions thing. Where are you going to be looking at this? Are you going to be looking at it on a plane? Are you going to be looking at it on your chair? Are you going to be looking at it you know, in your office? Are you going to be sitting around a boardroom? Are you discussing it with somebody else? Who's with you? What time of day are you doing it? And they start the conversation at that level. And the reason they start the conversation at that level is because that gives them a much better sense of what the experiences of that user are going to be. And it's only after they've got a thorough understanding of all those contexts that they will then start thinking about, what do I put on the screen? Because then they can say, well, is he going to be distracted? Is she going to be kind of comfortable? Is she going to be in an exploratory mood? Um, do I need to show the information in a different way for making a decision under pressure, but show exactly the same information in another way for browsing later? And, and that kind of, very often, this is why I talk about experience rather than interface, very often we jump straight in and we think about user interface. But it's not about user interface, it's really about user experience. And no interface will help you if it's wrong for the experience. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Please. As, as far as the people who design the best types of interfaces, do you find any correlation between introverts are the best ones to do this versus extroverts are the best types? Any, any relationship there that you know of? The best people to do this are teams. You know, it's not a person. It's, it, it's got to be a group of people. And the reason is that you need to balance all these different things, which is why I kind of emphasize that we have this variety of people. We have furniture designers. We have web designers. We have application designers. We have data geeks. We have people who can barely count to three. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of people doing our interfaces because it brings that pattern of experience. And so it really is a team effort to do that. I mean, occasionally you will find this great person who gets it and can, and, but you know, that's, that's rare. We, we, we typically have to build teams to do that and make sure you've got to, this is why, you know, diversity, and, and it's really funny, I talk to my HR department about all this all the time. You know, they have a diversity program and we're all trying to hire, you know, and ethnically and, and, and socially diverse people. It's actually really important because people see things in completely different ways and they jump to completely different conclusions. That's a really interesting thing. People have, I mean, cultural differences. The first time I went to China back in, uh, I think it was in 98, Shanghai Stock Exchange had just opened. Um, there were U.S. companies finally in the Shanghai Stock Exchange. There were uh, Shanghai companies finally in the U.S. Stock Exchange. And outside the Shanghai Stock Exchange, you had a big um, kind of LED display. Rather clunky old thing, because it was 1998. And um, it must have been a bad day in the Shanghai Stock Exchange, because everything was red. Disaster, you know? And I got there and I thought, well, how is, how, how is this possible? I thought this was like the world's rap most rapidly growing economy. It looks like, well, has something announced? Has it been an announcement or something? They said, no, no, it's great. It's a wonderful day. Everything's red. Because in China, red's an auspicious color. 
when you give somebody a New Year present, you give them a little red envelope with money in it. That's, that's the color of, of luck and good fortune. So when a stock is going up in the Shanghai Stock Exchange, they made it red. And when it was bad, they made it green. Now, they actually changed that a few years ago, and now they follow all the other stock exchanges in the world. But at that time, it was really interesting. Um, so you bring all these people, and that's just a silly example, but you bring people with these cultural backgrounds, it's really surprising what you get. So I'm a great believer in diversity and hiring and so on. When I started my team, it consists, well, I, when I took over my team three years ago, it consisted of um, 15 men. Um, yeah, thanks very much. 15 men, 10 of them were Swedish. Now we have um, 25 people, 10 of them are women, and from seven, seven different countries. So it's much more diverse. I think that's really important. Anything else? I've explained it all quite completely and perfectly in 50 minutes. I must try that again. Yes, please. I'm still grappling with how do you make the cultural change. So I understand, you know, provide the data in the format that they're going to sure. actually consume it. Um, the user experience, I got all of that. But like, if I'm dealing with clients who are expect to receive a PowerPoint deck with Excel charts sure. read and pasted in there every month according to the schedule, how do I change? What's, you know. So it's difficult for you to change that. And, but the secret is you don't change it. It's like the psychiatrist. You know, you've got to change yourself. They will change for you. So think of, um, <laughs> think of devices. Bring your own I always like this example of bring your own device. My son um, worked for a while in a large company. And you know, being my son, he had all sorts of gadgets and things. And he had his, I think he had his Galaxy phone at that time. And um, you know, he, he joined this company. And he wanted to do his email. And of course, he, he just assumed he would get email on his, on his phone. So how do I connect my phone to the, uh, to the corporate network? You, know, you're, you cannot connect your phone to the corporate network. What on earth are you thinking of? You know, you just can't bring a device into this building and just connect it to the network. You must be crazy. We've got secrets in here. We've got, you know, numbers and emails and things like that. And this went on and this went on and this went on. And then exactly, I can give you the exact date. It was um, the 4th of January, 2012. And that entire policy changed. What happened? His CEO came back from Christmas vacation with a new iPad. I walked into the office and said, how do I connect this to network, to the network? And then the IT department said, you know, they didn't turn around and say, no, no, you can't connect your iPad to the network. They immediately connected to the network. And it's, but that's important because for years we've talked about technology changing because millennials and young people are coming up and they're all so wired and they're all so online. That's not true. It actually changes top down when these big changes happen because that's when strategic decisions get made. You may need to wait until the point where your CEO comes in and says, you know, I'm really fed up with seeing all these numbers. I saw a wonderful chart on the front page of the New York Times and I want it to look like that. And that's when change really happens. Aside from that, you're just kind of chipping away at the edges, doing your best. But when that does happen, the change is like an avalanche. It's monumental and it happens instantly. And I, everybody I talk to who's been through this experience can repeat that same story, as I said about my son. You know, the, the, the CEO or the CFO or somebody comes in with an iPad, typically with an iPad or an iPhone, and suddenly the corporate policy changes overnight. You know, it's dramatic when it, when it does. So maybe you just have to kind of hold out for that, for that day. Just keep putting examples of really kind of great visualizations in front of them, hoping that uh, somebody gets a message. Anything else? Okay, I think we're done, Gunnar. Thank you very much.